Hello everyone, this is Dennis, and you are on the Den Electro channel. Today I will show you how to make such a small power supply, made on reverse running topology. Its power is about 18 watts. The voltage that it produces is 12 volts, and the maximum current is 1.5 amperes. The circuitry of this power supply is based on the Viper 22 chip, operating at a frequency of 60 kHz. It has protection against overload and overheating. Now I will show how to assemble such a power supply and test it. The power supply circuit looks like this. It is simple and contains few details. On the left, an alternating mains voltage of 220 volts is supplied, and on the right, the output will be 12. The most important part of this power supply is the Viper 22A chip. She controls the whole scheme. It is small in size and has eight pins. Some of them are combined and therefore on the diagram, it is marked as if there are four of them. The next most important detail is the T1 transformer. It has three windings, primary, secondary, and microcircuit power winding. Note that the primary winding is divided into two half windings. They are completely identical and each of them has 85 turns. It is recommended to do this, but in general it is possible to divide the winding and not symmetrically. In each of the half windings you can change the number of turns. For example, make 100 in one and 70 in the other. The main thing is that their total number is 170. Since all windings are wound in turn, in a transformer, the secondary winding will be sandwiched between the two primary windings. This will strengthen the electromagnetic connection between the windings and the voltage at the output of the power supply will sag less. I will not focus on other details. But if someone does not understand something, then always ask questions in the comments. I will make a board for this power supply from cardboard. The wiring and silkscreen printing will need to be printed and glued on both sides. Yes, it is not as reliable as Textilite or Gitinex but it's quick and easy. For ease of assembly, all parts are drawn on the top side. This reduces the chance of errors and makes it easier to navigate the diagram. In the places marked with dots, you need to make a hole with a thick needle and then insert the parts there. On the reverse side, they either bend or bite off, depending on their length. As I said, the power supply is built on the Viper 22A chip. But due to the fact that my board is made of cardboard, one problem arose. A high voltage field effect transistor is installed inside the micro circuit, which passes a rectified mains voltage through itself. And the resistance of its drain to source transition is pretty decent 15 ohms. Therefore, even with a small load, it will noticeably heat up. And with a power supply of 18W, there will be a boiler at all. The micro circuit is made in a DIP-8 package. It does not have a radiator mount. And therefore, in order not to overheat, it must give off heat to the board through its outputs. Of course, the drain and source heat up the most. For their cooling, in the place where the micro circuit is installed, there must be large copper tracks. The third and fourth output Feedback and power supply of the micro circuit do not affect cooling in any way. Therefore, so that the micro circuit does not overheat much, I came up with a small life hack. I soldered another micro circuit to it, only burned out. You can also use a burned out transistor. The main thing is that it be in the same package. A radiator can be screwed to its flange, and the legs can be soldered to the chip drain. The radiator can be taken in any size. Just make sure that it does not touch nearby parts. Naturally, in the cardboard, it will be necessary to make a larger slot so that the legs with solder fit in there. And now let's move on to winding the transformer. I will use this frame. There are four legs on one side and two on the other. Where there are four legs, there will be, as it were, a high voltage side. And where are two low voltage? I will start winding the windings from the high voltage side. First, I start winding half of the primary winding. 
I solder the end of the wire to the first leg, then I wind it up on the right behind the frame. And the wire comes out on the left. This makes one turn. The wire diameter is about three tenths of a millimeter. We wind all the other turns in the same direction. For the entire width of the frame, I managed to wind 32 turns. This makes one layer. In a good way, after that, you need to wind at least one layer of electrical tape. This is done to reduce the likelihood of an interturn short circuit. But keep in mind that each layer of electrical tape reduces the winding window of the transformer. If you take a thick wire and do not lay turns to turn, then at the end there will simply not be enough space for all the windings. Then again I make a layer of winding, and again one layer of insulation. And then the third layer of winding. This ends half of the primary winding and I make three layers of insulation. Here, the electrical tape is very important since the secondary winding will go further. Well, I don't bite off the primary winding wire, but I remove it up so that it doesn't bother me. Then I flip the frame. This will be the low voltage side. Then you need to take an ordinary electrical tape, preferably thicker, and cut into narrow strips, preferably a width of about half a millimeter. Tape must be wound around the edges of the frame, as shown in my photo. Here I will wind the secondary winding. I'll take a three-core wire with a diameter of about 0.4 millimeters. We start winding from the left leg. As in the case of the primary winding, I wind the wire on the right behind the frame, and then I bring it out on the left. This is how the first round turns out. There will be 28 such turns. The wire must be wound into the recesses between the strips of electrical tape. The height of the strips should be the same as the wound wire. Thanks to these walls, the wire of the secondary winding will not break into the slot to the primary winding. Thus, the wire is securely fixed and this will be additional protection against steam breakage between the primary and secondary windings. But if you do not want to make such strips, then you can wind the secondary winding without them. Then again, I make a three-layer insulation. The frame must be turned back to the high voltage side. Now I will wind the power winding of the micro circuit. The wire diameter is less than one-tenth of a millimeter. We start winding from the third leg. I take the wire to the left, wind it up behind the frame and bring it out to the right. Such turns must be made 55. The end of the wire is wound around the fourth leg and bitten off. To keep the wire in the middle, I also make restrictive strips of electrical tape. Then again, three layers of electrical tape. At the end, the second half of the primary winding is wound. The photo shows the last layer of winding, but in total it turned out two and a half layers. And between each of them there is a layer of electrical tape. The end of the wire that comes out on the left side must be wound on the second leg and bite off. All ends of the wires must be cleaned of varnish and soldered to the legs. On top of all the windings, you can make a single layer of electrical tape insulation. Also pay attention to the ends of the primary winding. The wire to the very first layer will go here. So that nothing touches it and there is no breakdown of the insulation, it can be sealed with a piece of electrical tape. So there will be additional insulation between it and the following layers. In this picture, I depicted a frame with all the windings. This is how they will look when you look at the frame from above. Perhaps it will be easier for someone to understand how to wind them. The ferret core of my transformer has these dimensions. There is an air gap in the middle, or it is also called non-magnetic. Its width is approximately 0.9 millimeter. The power supply we create is single cycle. Without a gap, the core can remagnetize and go into saturation. Then the core will overheat, a short circuit will occur, and all your work will fly to the moon. Therefore, there must be a gap. After I inserted the halves of the core into the frame, I measure the inductance. 
it turned out 1870 micro henries. And according to the calculations, I need 1530. To reduce the inductance of the winding, it is necessary to increase the non-magnetic gap. To do this, I pasted adhesive tape on one of the halves of the magnetic circuit. Left and right six layers. Now the halves of the core will move apart and the gap will be not only in the middle, but also on the sides. True, on the sides it will be so small that it is even impossible to measure it with an ordinary ruler or caliper. But the gap could be increased not only by placing adhesive tape. With the help of a needle file, you can slightly file the middle column. And then it will increase, and the inductance will also decrease. I also want to pay attention that the size of the gap is only an approximate guideline. You can look at it if, for example, you do not have an inductance meter. And if you have it, then by changing the gap you can adjust the inductance. In this case, the inductance of the primary winding will be more accurate. Now with scotch pads, the inductance is 1490. Almost exactly what you need. I'll leave it like that. Then the halves of the core can either be glued together or tightly pulled together with electrical tape. A properly assembled transformer is half the success of a good power supply. Now let's talk about the capacitor C3. Perhaps someone will have the same problem as me. Its capacitance is 1.5 nanofarads. I didn't have such a thing, and therefore I took three pieces of one nanofarad each. By the way, I took them from the ballasts of energy-saving light bulbs. I soldered two capacitors in series, so that their capacitance would separate. And the third soldered in parallel. After that, their total capacity turned out to be one and a half nanofarads. It is desirable to take the voltage of the capacitors at one kilovolt. Choke L2 is made of a ferret dumbbell. It is necessary to make 27 turns with a wire with a diameter of approximately 0.3 millimeters. The inductance should be about 10 microhenries. After assembly, it turns out here's such a nice power supply. The dimensions of the board are quite compact, 5 by 8 centimeters. On the reverse side, all parts are connected by jumpers. Almost all the wires are bare, so you need to be very careful and make sure that nothing closes anywhere. The first inclusion of the power supply must be done through an incandescent lamp. If everything is normal, then the light bulb will be extinguished. And if there is a short circuit somewhere, it will light up. The power supply starts working immediately, and voltage appears at its output. Only it is below 12 volts and constantly jumps. The signal light also flashes continuously. But if you connect a small light bulb that consumes about 100 milliamps, then the voltage levels off. All as I expected, 12 volts. If you turn it off, then the voltage starts to dance again. At first I thought that I had an error somewhere in the winding of the transformer. During the experiments, I wound two more of the same transformers and they all worked in exactly the same way. Therefore, I came to the conclusion that the calculation of this power supply is specially made in such a way as to skip pulses at idle. Due to this, the power supply at idle will consume less electricity. And when you connect even the smallest load, the power supply will turn on as it should. Further, in order to check the power supply for maximum power, I connected an electronic load to it. I turn the knob, and the power slowly increases. The first line of the display shows the voltage, and the second line shows the current. 12 volts, 1.5 amperes is stable. This is 18 watts, everything is as required. After the load starts to consume more than 1.7 amperes, the voltage begins to sag.
Also, if a short circuit occurs at the output of the power supply, then nothing bad will happen. The voltage will drop to zero, and when the malfunction is eliminated, the power supply will return to life. I will throw the layout for the printed circuit board on the cloud. The file opens in the Sprint Layout program. The link to it will be in the description. If someone does not like that the voltage at the output of the power supply without load is not stabilized, then another resistor can be added to the circuit. Its resistance will be about 150 ohms. In my old DVD player, the power supply is made on Viper 22A. And there at the output of 5 volts, the developers also put a resistor in the same way. With it, the voltage stabilizes, but keep in mind that the resistor will constantly draw current. He's small, but still. And it turns out that this is an absolutely useless detail. As you can see, the power supply turned out to be simple and compact. It can be used to power LED strips, light bulbs, motors, radios, players, and other low-power devices. By the way, I made this power supply using a special program that itself gives out the circuit and the denomination of the parts, depending on the specified parameters. But it only works with Viper series chips. If someone is interested, write about it in the comments. I think soon I will be able to make a video on it. That's all for today. Give this video a like. Subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Click on the bell so you don't miss new videos. And all for now.